Okay, everybody, assalamu alaikum. And today we are going to discuss cholinergic pharmacology. I hope um, this video will clarify all of your doubts related to muscadinic receptors and nicotinic receptors. And uh, before starting this uh, lecture, I must tell you all that cholinergic pharmacology and adrenergic pharmacology, if you understand uh, these two branches of the autonomic nervous system, pharmacology, so I'm telling you, pharmacology, the entire subject would be way much easier for you to study and to understand, and you would then study with excitement. Because um, inshallah, next year, when you would have a lot of um, other chapters that you'd study, so in so many mechanisms of the drugs, you would be just told that um, it had, you know, it triggers the muscarinic receptors, and then you would have to study the pharmacological effects. So at that moment, it would be really difficult for you all to go back um, and then, uh, you know, study pharmacology all over again. So I must uh, emphasize that you should study this branch of pharmacology like with huge interest. The books I've already recommended in the class, that is Lippincott. And to add, uh, and to that, I want to add up Katzen also. All right. Uh, okay, everybody, so let's start. Okay, so this is how acetylcholine looks like. Um, let's discuss, first of all, the structure of it, and then we would move on. Okay, what do we have first of all here? We have this N here which is nitrogen, of course, and then if you see, it has a positive sign here, right? It means that it is somehow an ion, and it won't be wrong to call it a sweater ion. And then you see one, two, three. Three groups are attached, three carbon molecules are attached. So we could say that it's a, what do we call it? We call it tertiary right whenever three things are three molecules are attached to an atom so we call it a tertiary compound right all right so we are going to discuss this in more depth when um, inshallah in my next lecture i would be reinforcing the um, cholinomimetic drugs with you but today we are going to start up with the introduction of how exactly acetylcholine works and everything. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, we have we, whenever we want to talk about the cholinergic pharmacology, we have to know that what are the uh, you know main switches which these drugs would be activating, which these drugs would be switching on. So you see, the switches would be nicotinic receptors. If you write switches, of course, I'll be marking you wrong. But just to, um, uh, you know, just to uh, use it as a metaphor, I use this word switch. So you see, there are two kind of receptors in our body, which are related to cholinergic pharmacology. First one is nicotinic receptors. Other one is muscarinic receptors. Now, nicotinic receptors are further divided into two main branches, right? Which is NM and NN. Now, what is this NM and what is this NN? Let's talk about it. Now, this NNM is the neuromuscular junction and this NN is the autonomic ganglia. All right. Whenever we talk about muscarinic receptors, we should know that there are five types of muscarinic receptor, out of which three are present in abundant amount. And whenever we talk about pharmacology, we discuss the first three more, and fourth and fifth, we don't discuss it that in depth, right? Okay. Now comes up the slide, which I want you all to have, as, uh, which I want you all to please look very carefully, right? Because this slide will help you to memorize where things are, how they work and everything, okay? All right, so now you see, first of all, over here, we know that 
the nervous system is divided into two types, right? Somatic nervous system, autonomic nervous system. And then we talked about that autonomic nervous system, which is innervating the efferent neurons, all right? So these autonomic nervous system, uh, the, the neurons of the autonomic nervous system are further subdivided into parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system, right? Okay, now talking about the uh, neurons which are innervating these. Parasympathetic neuron, okay, it has, if you see, if you look over here carefully, is it in preganglionic fiber? And then here it's postganglionic fiber. If you remember in my first lecture in which I tried to introduce autonomic nervous system to you all, I discussed that in detail that there is a paravertebral column where sympathetic nervous system has their ganglia really close to the spinal cord, right everybody? Okay, here, the sympathetic nervous system has it. You see, that's why the preganglionic fibers are short of the sympathetic nervous system, right? But when we talk about the preganglionic neurons of the parasympathetic nervous system, so you see over here, this is like large, okay? And then, when we talk about the postganglionic neuron, so we know that in the sympathetic nervous system there would be the um, uh, there would be a chain of ganglia next to the spinal cord, and then from there uh, the neuron would go all the way to the effector organ. So you see, it is like large, okay, large. However, if uh, you talk about the postganglionic neuron of the parasympathetic nervous system. So you would find this ganglia somewhere closer to the effector organ, okay? Now, <clears throat> sympathetic nervous system also innervates adrenal medulla and in the adrenal medulla, it actually activates chromaffin cells which releases epinephrine and norepinephrine. In my previous video, I, I've already discussed with you effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine Watch that if you want to talk about it in more detail. Now, you see, um, now we will uh, try to uh, look over here which neurotransmitter is being released and where it is, right? Okay, so today our concern is cholinergic pharmacology, cholinergic neurons, so we would actually spot where exactly out of these neurons acetylcholine is released, right? We are not concerned with the um, epinephrine, norepinephrine, no. We are just going to highlight where exactly uh, what these acetylcholine is released. So you see, if we talk about somatic nervous system, all right, so over here you see acetylcholine is released, all right, we got it. Then, when we talk about autonomic nervous system and specifically about the parasympathetic division, so we see acetylcholine is released here, acetylcholine is released here. It means that preganglionic uh, pre neuron, all right, and postganglionic neuron, both of these secrete acetylcholine, clear? And yes, we already talked about it, right? That this is acetylcholine is the rest and digest um the neurotransmitter where it is releasing everything um so that our normal body functions can happen all right talking about sympathetic nervous system let's discuss what exactly preganglionic neurons are secreting and okay they are releasing acetylcholine but when we talk about postganglionic fiber so what is released norepinephrine we are not going to talk about it then we talk about this thing, wait. Then we talk about um, sympathetic nervous system that is innervating adrenal medulla. And over here also, we can witness that acetylcholine is being released, right? Okay, so acetylcholine is being released and that actually 
affects the chromaffin cells and that produces norepinephrine and norepinephrine, right? Okay, so summarize it up. When we are summarizing, we can say that all of the preganglionic neurons release acetylcholine, right? And postganglionic neuron of parasympathetic nervous system is the only neuron that releases acetylcholine. We can also say that somatic nervous system releases acetylcholine. Okay? All right. Let's move on. Wait. Okay. Now, when we talk about, let's talk about the synthesis of acetylcholine. Okay. Acetylcholine. The word acetylcholine is telling you that it is made up of two things, right? Acetyl and choline. In chemistry, we must have studied what is acetyl. Acetyl is two carbon chain, right? Choline is a is a compound, right? Molecule. Okay. Now, if you look over here, starting from here, I know it's written here once, but I want you to start here. This choline. Choline is entering into the neuron. All right. And how it's entering? It, here, it needs energy. All right. And here, when choline enters, sodium also is in flux. All right, choline enters. From the other end, mitochondria, if you have studied um, the Krebs cycle and all, so you must have uh, studied that acetylcholine is produced, right? Now you see acetylcholine is uh, acetyl coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is produced, right? Now, what is this acetyl uh, CoA? This, when you look over here, CoA, coenzyme A, it serves like a taxi. Always remember, whenever there's a coenzyme, it serves as a taxi, right? Okay, so this coenzyme A serves as a taxi. It carries acetyl, choline, acetyl towards the enzyme where the enzyme would attach choline to the acetyl group and then this taxi, don't write taxi in the exam, all right? Taxi is a metaphor. Okay, so this taxi CoA, which is coenzyme A, it then gets detached from acetyl and then it gets back to the mitochondria, all right? Okay, now what is this enzyme called? Since it is transferring choline to the acetyl, all right? So we call this enzyme choline acetyl transferase all right so you see over here this coenzyme a gets detached goes back to mitochondria this choline gets attached to acetyl and then acetyl choline is produced which is a neurotransmitter now this neurotransmitter would obviously be packed into a vesicle right before it's being secreted before it's being released so now what happens is this, that then it's backed up into a vesicle. And then these vesicles are stored into the neuron till their release is initiated. We have already talked about when the neurotransmitters are triggered, uh, triggered to get released. They're triggered when there is action potential and calcium ions, calcium ions influx is there, right? All right, so you see over here, this vesicle gets closer to the neuron, all right, membrane, and then by exocytosis, this vesicle releases the neurotransmitter, right? And then this neurotransmitter is being released into the synaptic cleft. What is synaptic cleft? It is a space between two neurons. Right, everybody? Okay. Now you see over here, you have, <clears throat> you have this thing, which is A-C-H-E. All right. Now what is this A-C-H-E? A-C-H-E is acetylcholinesterase. It's an enzyme which breaks up the released acetylcholine into acetyl and choline. Right? So that's how its amount is being regulated. All right. Now 
when we talk about release of acetylcholine in the synaptic cleft i've already told you that you see everybody cal action potential reaches here into the neuron all right and that's how the calcium is influxed and as soon as the calcium ions are influxed so that's the moment when calcium uh, when acetylcholine actually diffuses out by the process of exocytosis into the synaptic cleft right everybody okay then uh the process by which yes we talked uh, talked over here we talked over here that uh, we also talked over here that this neurotransmitter is being released into the synaptic cleft now we know that because of the calcium ion the vesicle is brought closer to the membrane and that's how the neurotransmitter get released right now our minds should think what is bringing it closer to the membrane how it is releasing how it's getting released right okay so you see over here there is a complex of protein by the name of snair complex right now what happens is this as soon as the calcium ions are influxed at that moment this is snair complex brings the vesicle closer to the membrane and that's how when exocytosis happens and all of the neurotransmitters are being released into the synap into the synaptic cleft right everybody i repeat we have proteins right what are the protein names syntaxin snap25 synaptobrevin all right now these are the proteins which actually brings the uh, the is, now this collectively is called a snare complex and this is snare complex brings the vesicle further to the membrane and that's how exocytosis happens and this is this entire process is happening when calcium influx is there right everybody okay then we talked about presynaptic receptors okay presynaptic receptors what are they there are two types of receptors we are going to talk about one is autoreceptor other one is heteroreceptor when we talk about autoreceptor so you see both of these are here pre these are presynaptic receptors right everybody now this autoreceptor is a type of receptor located in the membrane of presynaptic neuron it serves as part of negative uh, feedback loop in signal transduction it is only sensitive to neurotransmitters or hor or hormones released by the neurons on which autoreceptor sits it means that this autoreceptor is you can exemplify this autoreceptor by a good person who does not care about others or do something to others okay the person also only cares about himself or herself now the thing is this he does not care or she does not care what other people are getting marks okay they only care how much they are getting and how exactly they can regulate their own uh, performance right okay so don't write that in the exam again it's a metaphor all right okay so auto receptor auto receptor okay which works by the action of negative feedback mechanism and it regulates how much of the neurotransmitter it should release or produce okay then the other type of presynaptic receptor is heteroreceptor now this is a person who cares about everybody in the university okay like how much other students are getting gpa and then like comparing doing work accordingly and everything okay so the thing is this heteroreceptor okay are terminal receptor for other transmitters okay for other transmitters that are sensitive to the hormonal or neurotransmitter release of neighboring neuron or cell it may act either to stimulate or inhibit release at that terminal sorry okay a cholinergic receptor on a for example a cholinergic receptor on a dopamine nerve terminal 
All right. Okay. All right. So now we are going to talk about how to block acetylcholine. All right. How to block acetylcholine release. So you see, this is over here. I just told you that choline gets entered into the neuron, right? Which is energy, which, which needs energy, right? So what happens is, this is a drug by the name of hemicolonium, all right? It is a choline carrier blocker and it inhibits choline uptake within the neuron, within the presynaptic neuron, okay? Now for storage, you see, there is a drug by name of Vesemicol, all right? It blocks the packaging of acetylcholine into the vesicle. Then there is a drug which is anticholinesterase, which is called neostigmine, and it is attacking the acetylcholine esterase. It is blocking it from breaking up uh, acetylcholine into choline and acetyl. Then is uh, this uh, botulinum toxin, all right? This is again a presynaptic toxin, okay, which prevents the release of the neurotransmitter into the synaptic lift. Gotcha. Then we would talk about this in our next class, not in our next class, in our third class, which is neuromuscular blocking agent, all right, and colonic receptor and leukotrienic receptor agonist, all right. These are the drugs which actually work on these receptors in order to prevent the action of these drugs. Okay. Then you see, I just talked a bit earlier that uh, this is the snare complex, okay? Snare complex is made up of synaptobrevin, syntaxin, and SNAP25. Now, what happens is this, when botulinum toxin enters into the body, so it actually starts breaking up this snare complex. And as a result, you see, the acetylcholine is not released at all. So acetylcholine is rapidly hydrolyzed and inactivated by tissue acetylcholinesterase and also by non-specific vitriol cholinesterase to choline and acetate. Okay. Now, uses of botulinum toxin. You see, when we look over here, we say that, oh my God, this is the one negative thing we are learning. But no, it has some positive uses as well. For example, this is one positive use of botulinum toxin that is, uh, some people do suffer from this um, uh, issue that their eye, all right, it um, like has this involuntary movement, okay? One eye blinks while the other does not. So this is called blepharospasm, all right? So this can be treated by the injection of blotnanum toxin. Then is hyperhidrosis, all right? This is also treated by the use of Botox, or you can say botulinum toxin. Then uh, there is, uh, uh, by the way, people, I really want to mention here this thing that please have some values and some sympathy for people who are suffering from these conditions, okay? Just don't make fun of anybody just like that. I want you all to be sympathetic and please uh, take care of the people around you. All right, so see, this condition is called strabismus. And over here in Scalera, the Botox has been injected in order to rectify the, or you can say to fix the eyeball. Now, this is dystonia. I, I have this video attached here. Now, what happens is this, that uh, this is actually the, uh, you know, this muscle cramping is there, right? You see, the person cannot, this is involuntary totally, the person cannot, like control the movements at all on its own on his own sorry you see okay then is of course 
all of the ladies are very well aware of it uh, that uh, one positive use is in the cosmetics all right in the cosmetics in form of cosmetics we use it in order to get rid of the wrinkles and everything all right so you see um, botox is being uh, injected into the uh, skin and then the person who has wrinkles like all of a sudden they look young all right cholinomimetric receptors i will just give a brief introduction about it and then we'll stop okay all right cholinomimetic receptor when we say it's cholinomimetic it means something that is promoting the release of acetylcholine okay all right so when we talk about acetylcholine release <clears throat> more and more so we'll of course talk about the receptors all right and in receptors there are two kind of receptors which are nicotinic receptors and muscarinic receptors <laughs> now you see when we talk about muscarinic receptors because that's what we are focusing more right now and inshallah in my fourth lecture we'll start focusing the nicotinic ones all right so we talked about muscarinic receptors that there are five types of muscarinic receptors m1 m2 m3 m4 m5 and then we talked this m1 m3 m5 produces the excitatory effect m2 m4 produces inhibitory effect we also talked about it earlier when i say m1 m3 m5 produces excitatory effects so what's the mechanism it is actually increasing phospholipase c and which as a result increases acetyl um, uh, um, uh, this ip3 i have very less minutes in my hand uh, guys if the video turns off so it means the lecture is over because um, i'm about to have load shedding in my area again okay so this is uh, like uh, the entire process okay let's jump to the next thing okay so over here i can talk to you more about it that over here you see you saw that m1 and m3 are focusing on the gq protein all right what is gq this is gpcr that is g protein coupled receptors and when this is activated how it's activated this gdp is converted into gdp all right and as a result <clears throat> and as a result you see there is um, uh, this ip3 which is inositol uh, triphosphate all right this is being produced and then the stored calcium gets converted into free calcium and then the activity is there right okay and then the other thing is this that um, there is other thing also produced which is called dag that is diacyl glycerol right everybody so what it does is this it actually works on uh, protein kinase uh, c and then it get activated and then the entire protein mechanism is there which i've already discussed with you in my previous lecture right so you got it how exactly this m1 m3 works then comes up to m2 m2 is this thing right it it, it works on the inhibitory g protein receptor so this g inhibitory protein all right uh, this actually inhibits the conversion of uh the entire thing okay less cmp is produced because if we look over here when stimulatory g protein is there so you see gdp is converted into g g g gtp is con uh, and then this gtp is attached uh, a lot of atp is converted into cyclic amp and then the entire process has happened now when it's negative inhibitory effect all right so as a result what would happen that this gdp would activate it but then when it will go over here it would inhibit adenyl cyclase to produce the cyclic amp right so less cyclic amp would be produced and as a result there would be increased potassium ion conduct conductance with uh, effector cell hyperpolarization all right um i am uh, if you want to Uh, look at this slide in detail so you can always pause it all right and then look at it i quickly want to move on here because this i think is more important all right so you see over here when you talk about location all right so this m1 receptors are more on sympathetic postganglionic neuron all right then its m2 receptors are more on cardiac and smooth muscles 
M3 receptors are more in the glandular cells, which is the gastric parietal cells and the vascular endothelium and vascular smooth muscles. And M3 receptors are on vascular endothelium. So all five of the receptor subtypes, including M4, are found in CNS neuron. All right, this is the last slide for today. That is M3 muscarinic receptors, how exactly they are working, apart from the G protein, uh, you know, that uh, inhibitory and um, uh, that 